Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, sir. Mr. Speaker, sir, um, I rise to inform Parliament about Fiji's national priorities for the 26th session of the Conference of Parties under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, or COP26 in short. COP26 will be held in Glasgow, Scotland, in person from 1 to 12 November 2021 under the presidency of the Government of the United Kingdom. This COP will be the most important since COP21 in 2015 when the Paris Agreement was adopted by 196 countries. The most important task for COP26, Mr. Speaker, sir, is to finalize the Paris Agreement rule book which guides implementation of the agreement. 20,000 people from around the world are expected to be there. Mr. Speaker, sir, I'll speak a bit fast because there's a bit to cover. Mr. Speaker, sir, before I get into the details of Fiji's national priorities for COP26, please let me remind everyone what is at stake for Fiji, the Pacific, and the planet. The sixth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Pan Plan Panel sorry, on Climate Change released in August this year shows that our planet is on course for virtual self-destruction before the end of the century due to uncontrolled climate change. The IPCC report states that global carbon dioxide concentrations are the highest in at least two million years and humans are to blame. We have emitted around 2.4 trillion tons of carbon dioxide since the late 1900s and we continue to emit more and much more each year. It is simply suicidal to continue such fossil fuel driven production and consumption. Mr. Speaker, sir, the global average temperature is now 1.1 degrees Celsius, higher than pre-industrial levels, and we are already seeing devastating impacts across the world. Heat domes are surging temperatures to record levels in the Americas, unprecedented cyclones and massive floods are occurring in Europe, and three major cycl tropical cyclones have devastated Fiji in a span of a year. Mr. Speaker, sir, current emissions reductions target set by countries are expected to increase the average global temperature to over 2.7 degrees Celsius before the end of this century. That is a far cry from the 1.5 degrees Celsius target that Fiji and other small island developing states fought hard to incorporate in the Paris Agreement. Keeping global average temperatures well below 1.5 degrees Celsius is not just some arbitrary desire of small island developing states. It is a matter of survival. Even a 0.4% increase in the global average temperature now will mean absolute catastrophe for us. It should be 0.4%, sorry, sir. Our Pacific Atoll neighbors will see their countries taken by the sea and low-lying coastal communities across the Pacific will suffer the same fate. Economies will be brought to their knees as catastrophic cyclones will become more frequent and erratic weather patterns will cripple food security. Even the famously non sublimant members of the opposition have managed to understand this through their sleepy haze. Unfortunately, not even that acknowledged has dampened the cynicism in attacking government's earnest and valuable work on the international climate stage. These armchair critics and members of the opposition continue to belittle, to belittle the Fijian government's steadfast commitment to address climate change, saying that COVID-19 is a more immediate priority but government cannot entertain the folly that we can ignore the very real threat to our long-term survival when we manage a very serious immediate threat. We cannot. It would be irresponsible and reckless not to do both simultaneously. These challenges are interconnected as our health, <coughs> excuse me, and our planet's health are inextricably intertwined. Climate change is a pandemic enabler, a pandemic accelerant, and a multi-pathway crisis that is the single greatest threat to the development of SIDS. Prior to COVID-19, there were mountains of scientific data and papers and research that showed that it was only a matter of time before a flu-like pandemic spread like wildfire. Yet the world did little collectively and proactively to combat this threat. The current circumstances around climate change are no different. We simply cannot be passive in the face of the existential threats posed by climate change. Otherwise, the devastation caused by COVID-19 is a mere glimpse of what climate change has in store for us. Mr. Speaker, sir, we are in a climate emergency and the climate change bill being debated on today has been carefully developed to address different aspects of this emergency. It is already guiding Fiji's national priorities going into COP26 and its enactment will give us a strong legal mandate and framework to advance our national priorities at the negotiating table to demand greater climate action from the global north. 
With the leadership of our Honorable Prime Minister, Fiji is held in the highest regard as a global climate champion. We have been vocal, we have been strategic, and we have been bold in continuously holding high-emitting countries accountable for the havoc they are inflicting on the planet through unchecked carbon emissions. But there is more to be done. We took on the COP23 presidency and excelled at that. We, as chair of the Pacific Forum, the Pacific has placed its faith in Fiji to elevate the Pacific as a powerhouse of climate ambition. Through an official forum decision, the region has collectively nominated Fiji to be the Pacific's high-level champion to COP26 on climate finance and oceans. Mr. Speaker, sir, going into COP26, the Fijian government does not only represent its people, it now represents the 2.3 million Pacific Islanders spread across the largest patch of ocean in the world. It's of course taking out Papua New Guinea. In this regard, we have set ourselves for four broad priorities for COP26 and indeed beyond. Mr. Speaker, sir, the first priority is lobbying for greater climate ambition. We are seeking far greater decarbonization commitments by large greenhouse gas emitting countries, establishing a deadline for these commitments to result in emissions peak and committing to achieving net zero carbon emissions by 2050. Mr. Speaker, sir, only 40% of the countries that ratified the Paris Agreement have actually submitted updated nationally determined contributions, or NDCs, to the UNFCCC. NDCs, Mr. Speaker, sir, are produced by parties to the Paris Agreement outlining national plans and commitments to reduce carbon emissions. They need to be updated at least every five years to show increased national commitment to reduce carbon emissions. Only a handful of countries, 33 in fact, have officially submitted their long-term commitments to transition towards net zero emissions by 2050. Fiji is among them. Mr. Speaker, sir, Fiji will not meekly pay the price for the world's inaction. Instead, we will wield every ounce of our moral authority at COP26 to demand greater decarbonization commitments by G20 countries. And we will do so from a position of strength Fiji is one of a few countries to ingrain climate adaptation, ocean conservation, nature-based solutions, and net zero commitments into its NDC. In doing so, we intend to reduce national carbon emissions by 30% by 2030 from a baseline year of 2013. We have also developed a low emissions development strategy that serves as a roadmap for transitioning the Fijian economy towards, a net zero, towards net zero, sorry, by 2050. Mr. Speaker, sir, Fiji's climate leadership is not limited to policy-based interventions. Despite contributing only 0.006% to global greenhouse gas emissions, we are exemplifying the level of climate action we demand from the rest of the world through innovative projects, including an agro-photovoltaic 4 megawatt solar power plant in Bureta in Ovalau and potentially four other sites in Fiji which we are currently exploring. Energy Fiji Limited or EFL in close in cooperation with its new partner, the Japanese consortium, Seven Pacific Pri uh, Private Limited, is also working towards increasing its renewable energy generation mix by investing in solar energy solutions. With four large-scale solar projects that are expected to help EFL generate at least 90% of its energy from renewable sources by 2030. Fiji is also implementing off-grid solar and hydro renewable energy solutions to rural communities through the Department of Energy and the Fiji Rural Electrification Fund. This is expected to assist the remaining 4% of the Fijian population that do not have access to electricity. Mr. Speaker, sir, a growing economy and indeed one that is recovering from the pandemic needs greater access to energy be it to keep manufacturing plants running, businesses electrified, and vehicles moving. But we must realize that Fiji's third highest import is fossil fuel. Our dependency on non-renewable energy must be reversed through, through the economy-wide investments in low-carbon technologies. Greater climate uh, mitigation will now reduce the need for, great, for greater climate adaptation in the future. Mr. Speaker, sir, our goals for climate ambition in Glasgow are to A, finalize the Paris rulebook at, at COP26. This means agreeing to outstanding matters related to carbon markets, common time frameworks for NDCs, and mechanisms for enhanced transparency under the Paris Agreement. B, secure additional commitments toward much stronger NDC targets by 2030, 
and all countries to commit to net zero emissions by 2050 in line with 1.5 degrees Celsius pathway. And C, increase access to affordable financing for developing countries who have included adaptation commitments in the NDCs. Mr. Speaker said these sub-priorities are expected to be mutually reinforced through part, three, through part 3, 7, 8, and 9, and 10 of the Climate Change Bill. Priority two, Mr. Speaker, sir. The second priority, Mr. Speaker, sir, of the area of it is increased resource mobilization for adaptation and loss and damage. Mr. Speaker, sir, the latest climate finance assessment by OECD shows that only 21% of global climate finance is mobilized for climate adaptation, while 70% goes to climate mitigation, and the remaining 9% goes to cross-cutting projects. Despite being among the most climate vulnerable regions in the world, the Pacific is receiving less than 1% of global finance, which is further split between mitigation and adaptation. It is unfair and indeed unsustainable, Mr. Speaker, sir. Mr. Speaker, sir, Article 9, Paragraph 4 of the Paris Agreement clearly states the need to aim for a resource mobilization balance between climate mitigation and climate adaptation. This is not happening and must be urgently corrected. Fiji will press for affordable climate finance to be made more accessible to developing countries, and more importantly, to raise additional climate finance for adaptation. We seek to provide strong guidance to bilateral and multilateral sources of climate finance to prioritize financing for adaptation projects, and we'll be putting pressure on these funding sources to better support countries that have developed their national adaptation plan. The reasoning, Mr. Speaker, sir, is simple. Due to the damage already done to the climate, we will have to spend billions on adaptation. Fiji has already developed a robust national adaptation plan with over 160 action items that now need financial support to implement. Mr. Speaker, Sir, Fiji is also placing strong emphasis on nature-based solutions to support adaptation actions. Such solutions take an integrated approach to climate adaptation without causing damage to natural biodiversity. A dozen low-lying communities have already benefited from this innovative solution, while another 19 priority communities have been identified for assistance in the 2021-2022 financial year. In order to be replicated in other parts of Fiji, such transformative solutions deserve far more financial support from climate finance sources. Case in point, sea walls, we're talking about in Namatakula. Mr. Speaker, sir, climate adaptation is about protecting against future climate impacts. But small island developing states are already experiencing irreversible harm. This is known as loss and damage in the international climate arena, and it entails mobilizing resources to retroactively address climate impacts. It was a hard fought victory for small island developing states and for the cause of climate justice to include loss and damage under Article 8 of the Paris Agreement in 2015. Nevertheless, Mr. Speaker, said developed countries have continued to put off the question of financing for loss and damage. Mr. Speaker, said the subject of loss and damage is personal for Pacific Islanders, as they have already suffered irreversible harm from uh, climate change. Since 2011, the Fijian government has helped relocate six communities entailing 78 households at a cost of Fijian $3.6 million. There are over 40 rural communities that need urgent relocation due to slow and sudden onsets of climate change. To address these future human mobility needs, the Fijian government has established the Climate Relocation of Communities Trust Fund, which has received an initial grant commitment of Fijian $2.5 million from the government of New Zealand. We are now working on facilitating the relocation of communities in Vanuatu that have been severely impacted by multiple cyclones, salt water intrusion, and land degradation. At COP26, Mr. Speaker, sir, Fiji will be pushing for the rapid mobilization of collaborative networks on loss and damage to create more financing opportunities. The specific sub-priorities for Fiji under the overall priority of increased resource mobilization for adaptation and loss and damage are as follows. A, dedicated financing for loss and damage that goes beyond insurance-based solutions. B, progress work program for Warsaw International Mechanism and loss and damage and C, increased support for Santiago network of technical experts on loss and damage and dedicated assistance through the network to Pacific SITs. Mr. Speaker, sir, these sub-priorities are expected to be mutually reinforced 
through parts 11 and 12 of the Climate Change Bill. Priority three, Mr. Speaker, sir. The third priority area is creating permanence of oceans in the UNFCCC agenda and promoting the ocean climate nexus. The ocean sequesters approximately 31% of global carbon emissions and contains 16 times more carbon than the terrestrial biosphere, making it a powerful buffer between humanity and climate catastrophe. Some may not know that, that Fiji is the 26th largest nation when it comes to size of our exclusive economic zone, or EEZ. No one should view us as a small set of dots on the world map, but a large ocean state with significant potential for a vibrant blue economy. In recognition of the obvious linkages between the ocean and climate, Fiji created and led the initiative to ingrain an ocean pathway into the UNFCCC process as part of its COP23 presidency. We have come a long way in this pursuit, Mr. Speaker, sir, and created a strong alliance within the Alliance of Small Island States and the G77 and China group to have a dedicated permanent home for oceans in the UNFCCC process. At COP26, Fiji will be pushing for decision text on oceans that engrains ocean issues within the UNFCCC and ensures due diligence of formal processes for the ocean climate nexus to gain a permanent mandate in the UNFCCC. Mr. Speaker, sir, Fiji continues to engage in pioneer climate initiatives that set it apart from the rest of the world. We are one of the first small island developing states to have developed a, nation, a national ocean policy that provides a roadmap for sustainable ocean action based on two fundamental targets. A, 30% of Fiji's EEZ to be designated as marine protected areas or MPAs by 2030, and B, 100% of Fiji's EEZ being sustainably managed by 2030. Mr. Speaker, sir, we are walking the talk by operationalizing the nation, national ocean policy through innovative financing mechanisms. Based off Fiji's successful issuance of a green bond in 2017, which is listed on the London Stock Exchange, the Fijian government is working with the government of the United Kingdom and the United Nations Capital Development Fund to issue a blue bond by the middle of 2022, which is next year. The blue bond will finance sustainable commercial aquaculture to combat structural unemployment after COVID-19. It will finance hybrid electric inter-island shipping to bridge the rural-urban divide and improve access to markets and, of course, people mobility. And it will finance coastal protection using integrated nature-based solutions expected to generate revenue for coastal communities. All of this, Mr. Speaker, sir, supports a post-COVID recovery while addressing the need for climate-sensitized development. Fiji plans to promote this innovative integrated approach to ocean climate finance at COP26 to augur grant-based co-financing from bilateral development partners and equi equity-based financing from the private sector. Mr. Speaker, sir, our goals for the ocean at COP26 are to firstly, A, generate support for ocean work program and agenda in the UNFCCC processes in line with the ocean's pathway, B, push for blue components of NDCs to be promoted and tracked, C, generate support for further research and capacity building to enhance developing countries' understanding of the ocean climate nexus, D, enhance financing for oceans and fisheries related adaptation activities, and E, discuss options for implementing the recommendations of the 2020 Ocean Climate Dialogue Report recommendations co-chaired by Fiji. Mr. Speaker, sir, these sub-priorities are expected to be mutually reinforced through Part 13 of the Climate Change Bill. The last priority, Mr. Speaker, sir, which is the fourth priority, is improve access to affordable climate finance, which directly impacts the achievability of all of our objectives. Access to affordable climate finance, Mr. Speaker, sir, is lagging behind in the Pacific. We access less than 1% of global climate finance. Even more disturbing, Mr. Speaker, sir, 74% of overall climate finance mobilized was in the form of loans, while only 20% were grants, and the remaining 6% were in the form of equity-based investments. Why do small island developing states have to access finance for their development at punishing rates when countries of the global north with greater debt exposure can access these funds at net zero interest? Why can recovery from climate catastrophes not be funded through grants? 
Why must we be forced to take more loans to rebuild from climate catastrophe that are caused by others? We will be demanding answers to these hard questions at COP26, Mr. Speaker, sir, both in open forums and at the negotiating table. Fiji has been successful in negotiating access to highly concessional IDA funding for climate vulnerable countries while chair of the World Bank Small States Forum. We intend to replicate that leadership as chair of the Pacific Forum and lobby for mobilization of greater concessional climate finance from financial mechanisms under UNFCCC, such as the Green Climate Fund, Adaptation Fund, Global Environment Facility, and Climate Technology Center and Network. In doing so, we'll also intend to put pressure on multilateral development banks such as the ADB to start providing concessional financing under a climate vulnerability access window. And indeed, our talks with the UK is that the UK as a shareholder of ADB is now agreeable to this proposition and they use the influence with the other European shareholders. Mr. Speaker, sir, Fiji's need, Fiji needs approximately Fijian $9.3 billion over a 10-year period to adapt the Fijian economy. An additional Fijian $6 billion is needed by 2030 to help Fiji achieve its NDC targets. Some critics question the legitimacy of Fiji's climate action against the enormity of these financing needs. They fail to realize that the first half of the equation to mobilize effective climate finance is the ability to clearly quantify your financing needs, while the second half is actually receiving and effectively managing the finance. Most climate vulnerable countries fail with the first half of the equation, but by proactively costing its climate finance needs, Fiji was able to mobilize approximately Fijian $1.09 billion in development finance from external partners between 2016 and 2019 alone. The world, Mr. Speaker, sir, has taken note of Fiji's proactive approach to quantifying its climate finance needs and its innovative financing solutions. In fact, Mr. Speaker, sir, Fiji is co-chairing the influential task force on access to climate finance within the UK Top 26 Presidency, UK COP26 Presidency, to develop a set of innovative principles and recommendations for improving direct access to affordable climate finance. These principles and recommendations will then be piloted in five climate vulnerable developing countries, and Fiji is already a front runner to be one of the five pilot countries. This new and innovative approach will be heavily marketed at COP26, and Fiji stands to benefit significantly from it. However, the size, scope, and speed of climate finance needed still far outweighs and what is actually being mobilized. To remedy this failing, Mr. Speaker, sir, we'll be pursuing the following at COP26. A, delivery of the US $100 billion per year climate finance goal, this is globally. B, the start of the negotiations on a new climate finance quantitative target prior to 2025 from a flow of US $100 billion per year, a sum of US $750 billion per year is being pro proposed, in particular by the, the climate uh, vulnerable countries an increase in climate financing for SIDS to up to 10% of global climate flows, D, an increased climate finance allocation for adaptation to at least 60% of an overall global climate finance flow, E, the securement of long-term private sector investment and adaptation, F, an increase in grant-based and long-term concessional climate funding from public sources for SIDS, and G, simplified access to process and reporting templates for global climate funds. Mr. Speaker, sir, these sub-priorities are expected to be mutually reinforced through parts 14 and 15 of the Climate Change Bill. Mr. Speaker, sir, I think I'm now within my time. And as a matter of conclusion, Mr. Speaker, sir, Fiji's participation in COP26, led by Honorable Prime Minister, is critical to ensure that Pacific voices, perspectives, and solutions continue to inspire the global momentum on climate action. We simply cannot sit on the sidelines and wait for some multilateral miracle to save the climate. It is, up, it is up to countries like Fiji to drive the climate agenda, which indeed we are. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, sir. I thank the Honorable Attorney General for his ministerial statement.